All right, so here comes the more difficult to digest part of this training about cryptography. Now, don't worry, you don't really have to know the math behind of it. We have computers for that, but there are a couple of ideas that you really have to understand, a couple of terminology, uh, methods, algorithms that you should be able to explain in order to pass the exam. Now, this cryptography discussion is going to last a couple more videos, but for now, we're just introducing some terms, clearing up some definitions, and making sure that we all know what we're talking about and what's going on whenever we talk about cryptography. So let's get started. Okay, so let's start with some of the official terms that you will find when discussing cryptography. And one of the main topics in cryptography is encryption. Now, hiding information uh, so that it cannot be decoded by somebody else. Now, before talking about encryption, we need to talk about the different stages or shapes in which our content, our data that we want to encrypt can be presented in. And the first one is going to be the plain text, also known as clear text. This is the unencrypted version of the data. This is the version that anybody can read, don't need any type of keys, credentials, any process you need to go through in order to read this content. It's open, available, readable, interpretable. It's out there in the open. Next, we have the ciphertext. This one refers to the encrypted version of the same plain text. So this one cannot be read by anyone except for the people that have the decryption key. And then we have the cipher. This is the algorithm that we're using to perform the encryption operation. And of course, we're gonna be using a different version of the same algorithm to perform decryption from the ciphertext in order to bring back the plain text. In most situations, whenever we deal with encryption or the encrypted data, keep in mind that in order to actually use that data, in order for that data to be uh, used by users, by applications, by devices, that data needs to be decrypted first. So we can only work with plain text. We cannot work with ciphertext, but we can store and we can transmit ciphertext whenever we need to protect that information. And finally, we have cryptanalysis. Now, cryptanalysis is the process of analyzing encrypted data and trying to figure out or to decode it or to break the encryption cipher or the encryption key. So it's a way to reverse engineer the encryption process. Now, in the world of cryptography, there are two large categories of algorithms that deal, and here we have algorithms that deal with hashing, and hashing is a mathematical operation that receives a variable input. It can receive any type of input, actually, and produces a fixed length output, always a fixed length output. Now, hashing is not encryption. We're going to talk about each of those in following slides, but for now, keep in mind that hashing cannot be reversed. Hashing can take any input and it's always going to provide a fixed length output, which means that the process cannot be reversed. So it cannot be used instead of encryption. Now encryption, on the other hand, receives any kind of input and then produces a variable length of output in order to represent the encrypted version of that same input data. Encryption, of course, can be reversed depending on the algorithm, depending on what keys were used. But this, again, is a discussion that we're going to have in the following minutes. So let's talk about hashing first, because hashing functions are the simplest implementation of algorithms that you will find in the cryptography world. So a hashing algorithm is a, an algorithm or a function that, as we just said before, takes a variable length input. It can take any input out there. It can be a simple password. It can be a word. It can be an entire document. It can be an entire 10 gigabytes movie file and always produces a fixed length cryptographic output called a hash. Now that fixed length depends on the algorithm that we're using. It can be uh, 64 bits in length, 128, 256 bytes and so on. That's a typo right there on the screen. It should be 256, right? Now, if we think about it for a second, since we can take a password and generate a 64-bit output string, and we can also take a 10 gigabytes video file and output a 64-bit output string, it's pretty obvious that we're not gonna be able to reverse this operation. Otherwise, we would be able to obtain that original 10 gigabyte video file from those 64 bits of output, which is mathematically impossible. This makes hashing functions one way only. 
how does this help us? I mean, what's the use of transforming your data into something that basically loses the original content that cannot be used to recover the original content? Well, the main use case for hashing functions is for ensuring integrity of data. That is because while the same input is always going to produce the same output, changing even one bit in that input is going to produce a completely different output, which leads us to situations where we need to ensure integrity of data. And remember, integrity is one of the three pillars, like uh, right next to confidentiality and availability. So this becomes a method of ensuring integrity of data. You're sending an email message. You wanna be sure that the email message hasn't been changed or altered in transfer. You calculate the hash of that email message on the delivery side and then on the receiving side. If the hashes match, then the message hasn't been altered. You can use a hash to hash files on your hard drive in, in order to determine whether those file contents have changed. For example, to determine if they have been altered by some piece of malware or by some crypto locker. Again, ensuring integrity. This is actually the way file integrity monitoring tools work. So we have a couple more use cases for hashing functions. But for now, let's just think of hashing functions as a way to preserve or to validate integrity of data. Now, there are situations where hashing functions can produce collisions. I mean, if you just think about the fact that uh, a 10 gigabyte file as an input can produce 64 bits of output. Now, obviously, there are more variations of possible inputs that we can provide to that hashing functions than the possible results that can be generated by that hashing functions in those 64 bits of output, which leads us to situations where potentially multiple inputs can cause the same output. This is called a hashing collision. Now, these are not desirable because this is a way to break integrity, which basically means that we cannot be 100% sure from now on that any changes that we perform on that input are going to generate a different hashing output. And while talking about use cases for hashing functions, we just mentioned that we use them to ensure integrity of data. We can also use them to store passwords. That's because normally we should never, never store passwords in clear text, or actually we should never even store passwords. Doesn't matter if they're obfuscated or encrypted or in any way, we should never store user passwords. Let's think about your web application. Maybe you have an online store where users can create their own accounts, they set their passwords. Where do you store those passwords? Where you should not store them in any database. You should not store them in clear text nor encrypted. What you should do is you should be storing a hash of the user's password. Remember, the hash is always going to be a fixed length. Now, the fixed length hash is also non-reversible, which means that if your web application is at some point breached, the victim of a data breach, and let's say your user database gets compromised and gets published somewhere in the internet, well, at least the passwords are not going to be compromised as well because you're not storing the passwords, you're only storing the hashes for those passwords. How are you using those hashes when you're actually validating user identities? Well, that's simple enough, right? You receive the credentials from the user when they try to authenticate, and instead of comparing letter by letter their passwords, you're actually comparing the hash generated from the user provided password with the hash stored in your database. If those two hashes match, then the password provided by the user was the right one. It doesn't matter if you cannot know what that password is. You just know it's the right one. It was the right one that was set from the very beginning by that user. Some example of hashing algorithms, you're gonna find MD5, that stands for Message Digest 5, or SHA, Secure Hash Algorithm. There are multiple versions of the Secure Hash Algorithm. Some of them differ by the length of the output of how many bits they produce as the, as the digest message that they generate. But for now, remember these two items right here. Hashing is not encryption and hashing is not reversible. You cannot obtain the original content just by analyzing the resulting hash. By the way, you can find a lot of hash calculators online. The process itself, it's not a very CPU intensive one, at least if you're not using it for very large data sets. So for example, using this very simple website here, I could, for example, type Andrew right here in the, in the text field, click on hash. We scroll down here, I'm gonna find all the results for different uh, hashing algorithms 
for this original text of Andrew. Here's the MD5 algorithm that we just talked before. Here are the different versions of the SHA algorithms. Notice that the 256, 384, 512 here at the, at the end actually represent the length of the resulting bit stream. So SHA 256 means we have 256 bits of data. This is a hexadecimal representation. Each hexadecimal letter here uh, represents four uh, binary digits, four bits, which means that uh, we're basically looking at a 64 uh, hexadecimal character string right here. Now, just to show you that this, uh, these hashing algorithms are actually dependent on the input, let me just uh, grab the same input right here and then change the A in Andrew with a capital A and then press hash. Let's scroll down one more time. Let's compare left to right. And you can see that neither of the hashes on the left even closely resemble the hashes on the right. So it was enough just to change a letter from lowercase to uppercase, and we get completely different results. Now, on the other hand, of course, if I were to generate the same, ask for the same input and click hash, calculate it one more time, this time we're gonna get the exact same results. Left-hand side equals right-hand side down to every bit. Also on the topic of ensuring integrity, you might have noticed that on file download sites, legitimate file download sites, uh, you are sometimes presented right next to the download link with a hash value of that installation file. This is for you to be able to check after you download that installation file or that executable file that it actually matches the hash that it was generated from the vendor of that software product. This way you can be sure that the, uh, the executable file hasn't been altered in transit or the website hasn't been cracked in the meantime and somebody, some attacker has replaced that executable file with a malicious version of it. So that's one way of ensuring integrity when you're even downloading files. Digital signatures on documents work following the same principle. You attach to the document a hash value of that document so that whoever receives it can then validate that that file hasn't been tampered in the meantime. Now, in real life, we're combining this hash value with some personally identifiable information so that we can be sure that the signature actually belongs to a specific person, but the algorithms behind this behavior are exactly the same ones as you saw in the previous page. Next on the list, are encryption algorithms. Now, encryption as a mathematical operation in itself, again, receives any kind of input. We can encrypt any type of data, but it's also going to present as a result a variable length output. That is because encryption is reversible. So we can reverse the encryption process if we have the corresponding key used for encryption. Now we need a key for the encryption because otherwise there's no protection for the data that we're trying to actually protect, right? If we're just relying on a specific algorithm, well, algorithms are well known. Encryption algorithms are well known. So there's actually no protection involved in there. Anybody could reverse that same algorithm without having the necessary key to access that data. How is encryption performed at a binary level, at a character level, bit level? Well, it's basically trying to preserve the original content. So there are only two things you can do that can be reversed and don't run the risk of losing that original content. First of all, we can perform transposition. That is just switching letters and bits around. That's transposition. And substitution. Substitution means replace any occurrence of a certain character with another character or any occurrence of a certain byte sequence with another byte sequence. And as long as you don't lose the mapping <laughs> between the original byte sequence and the replaced byte sequence, then you can reverse this process. But basically all encryption actually relies on these two operations, transposition and substitutions. Anything else cannot be reversed. If you add more content, then you don't know what content you need to remove in order to obtain the original, uh, original file. If you delete any content, then again, you're losing the original file, the original version. And a very big idea, very important idea in, uh, in cryptography and in encryption specifically, is that the key is the one that has to be secret. The algorithm is the one that has to be public. So you're never hiding a message by relying on the fact that nobody knows the decryption algorithm. You have to rely on the fact that nobody knows the decryption key. And the combination of an encryption algorithm 
and an encryption key has to be secure enough so that you can ensure confidentiality without even protecting access to the encrypted data. You basically have to reach a point where you don't care who has access to the encrypted data because you're 100% certain that in the absence of the right decryption key, they will not be able to access that information. That's basically how we are relying on, let's say, online shopping every single day. I mean, we are transmitting our credentials, our credit card information over the public internet where anyone can intercept that data, anyone can listen to it, and anyone can try to decrypt it we just have so much trust in the encryption algorithm and the encryption keys that our browser are automatically using behind the scenes whenever we're, we're buying whatever it's in our shopping cart that we don't care about the fact that our traffic might be intercepted. We trust technology, we trust encryption algorithms and keys to keep our data secure. So never rely on the secrecy of the algorithm. That's one of the, of the commandments of, uh, of encryption. Relying on a secrecy of the algorithm is something called security through obscurity or security by obscurity. This is bad. This is not considered to be true security because with computers, hiding information without encrypting it, it's not a valid option. If it's in there, somebody will find it at some point. And on the topic of secret encryption algorithms, the idea here is that the algorithms are just mathematical operations. Now, some of them have weaknesses. Some of the algorithms have weaknesses that make them more susceptible to being broken by cryptanalysis. So the idea here is that you're probably not going to be able to develop from scratch a better algorithm than the ones that have been thoroughly tested and attempted to be broken in the past 20 or 30 years or so. So you're probably not going to create an algorithm better than those. So why not use those thoroughly tested algorithms and rely on the fact that the secrecy of your data lies on the secrecy of the encryption key. And on the topic of encryption, we actually have two types of encryption. We can perform symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption. Let's start with symmetric encryption because this is the one that it's the easiest one to understand and the easiest one to implement actually. Now, symmetric encryption relies on the fact that you're using a single key to both encrypt the data and to decrypt the data when necessary. And by the way, when we refer to keys and encryption, what do you think a key looks like? It's just a string of bits. It's just a number of bits. It could be something that looks like a password, if those bits can be interpreted as a, as a word or as a sequence of characters, but it might be just a randomly generated sequence of bits of a specific length. That's your key. It doesn't matter how it looks like. It doesn't have to, to have any meaning. It doesn't have to look in a specific way. It's just a sequence of bits that you and only you and only those people authorized to access that data should know, which leads us to the big problem of symmetric encryption. And that is, how do you manage that key? If, you, if I want to communicate something securely to you, then I can send you that encrypted data and I can be sure that whoever intercepts that data is not going to be able to use it because it's not going to be able to read it. But how am I going to send the key to you? So this is one of the big problems in cryptography, actually. I mean, we can secure data using keys, but how do we secure the keys? All right. <laughs> now, there are a number of solutions for this, and they are thoroughly discussed in the Cybersecurity Analyst course, in the Size Plus course, because they're a bit more advanced. But in general, whenever we need to perform this type of key distribution, secure key distribution, we either use a specific algorithm that deals with this key negotiation phase, or we simply use a different channel. So I could send you the encrypted data over email, for example, or just post it somewhere online where you can download it from. And then I would send you the, the decryption key or the password for that data using some other means over, I don't know, SMS, over instant messaging. I, I could even dictate it to you over the phone, for example, but it should be on a different channel. Another problem tied to symmetric encryption is the fact that the key that we are using to encrypt and decrypt is the same key that everybody has to use to encrypt and decrypt. So if I were to uh, send that data to a group of people, to a number of people, well, then I have to share that key with all those people as well. Now, since there's no identity information connected to that key, first of all, if somebody sends me encrypted information using that key, I have no idea who sent it. 
And secondly, if that key becomes compromised, if somebody loses it, if somebody writes it on a post-it note and sticks it to their, to their display, and somebody else comes by and sees that password and starts using it, I'll have no idea that the key has been compromised. And I'll have no control over the distribution of that key. I mean, everybody who has access to that key can share it to whoever they want, which is not that good from a security standpoint. Now, on the positive side of symmetric encryption is the fact that it's a very fast method. It can be hardware accelerated because it's easy to implement in hardware, so we can encrypt and decrypt large amounts of data quite fast. Actually, it's the number one method of encryption used for large sets of data, such as VPN traffic, whatever we were sending through a VPN connection, uh, storing encrypted files on disk or even encrypting entire disks, sending encrypted emails, sending encrypted files over any kind of protocol, and any kind of protocol that uses encryption is going to rely at some point on symmetric encryption inside of its payload. What are the cons of it? Well, everything else we talked about. We have no control over identity, over the distribution. How do you store it? How do you, how do you share it in a secure manner? Right? We will lose all that control because we have one single key that is being shared by everyone else. Not only I cannot use symmetric encryption to ensure authentication, because I don't have any identity information connected to that key, but I also cannot use it to ensure integrity. And that's because if multiple people know that the same encryption key, I lose the confidence that whenever I send a message from A to B, that message hasn't been intercepted and altered in transit by somebody else who knows the same decryption key. Because theoretically, at least, somebody could have intercepted that message, decrypted it, made some changes in it, encrypted it back with the same key and then send it to its destination. I have no control if the, something like this happens and I have no method of detecting something like this happening. Now, the way encryption actually behaves under the hood it also depends on the type of traffic or the type of data that we are trying to encrypt. That's why we have two actual methods of performing encryption. Those two methods are based either on stream ciphers or on block ciphers. Now, let's focus on stream ciphers for just a second here. Now, stream cipher means that we're going to have to apply encryption to a constant stream of data, of bits. This kind of looks like what we would have to do if we were to encrypt streaming traffic, for example, like Netflix traffic, or when you have to encrypt something like a VPN connection. Now, the VPN connection is always active. It might pass traffic, it might pause for some time, you might send some requests, then you might send some bulk data in there, but there's always gonna be a constant stream of data passing through that VPN tunnel that you'll have to constantly encrypt and decrypt on the other side. So this type of encryption has to be performed bit by bit because we don't know the exact length of the data that we're supposed to encrypt, like we would know, for example, if we just had to encrypt one single file on the disk. But with VPN traffic, for example, we just see those bits flowing in there. We have to dynamically on the fly apply those encryption algorithms to all those bits. Now, since we cannot start from the very first bits, how do we encrypt a bit? right? <laughs> if, if I give you a bit of one, how do you encrypt that? What are you going to do? You're going to change it to zero, <laughs> right? That's all, that's all you can do, right? As far as encryption goes. No, we don't start from the very first bit. We actually start with something called an initialization vector. We start from a predefined randomly generated set of data that we pretend to be the beginning of our stream cipher. And then we start concatenating the rest of the data that gets generated to that initialization vector. So that's the very, very short explanation of how a stream cipher is implemented. Now, on the other hand, we have block ciphers. Block ciphers work with blocks of data. So they perhaps know exactly what type of data they expect to encrypt. Then they slice that data into fixed blocks which can be 64 bits, 128 bits, doesn't matter how big the block is. The idea here is that each and every block is gonna be encrypted individually. So we take one block of data and we performed all those transpositions and substitutions on that block. We get a resulting encrypted block and then we move on to the next one, right? Then we concatenate all those blocks and there's the resulting encrypted data. 
Of course, we need to perform some padding if we cannot exactly slice the data that we have into a fixed number of equally sized blocks. So we, again, we're gonna have to generate some additional padding, additional data, just to provide a nice alignment for those blocks. And the main problem here, at least with the simplest implementations of block ciphers, is the fact that since we apply the encryption algorithm individually to each block, it means that two identical blocks, and that can happen, of course, two identical blocks can generate identical cipher text, which is really bad in situations where you're trying to perform cryptanalysis or an attacker is trying to perform cryptanalysis because let's face it, not every data is unique. For example, uh, any email message might start with the same introductory section. Any email message might end with the same signature. Now the blocks representing the signatures, for example, at the end of that email message are all going to look the same, even in the encrypted version of that email, which is going to help that attacker that is trying to perform the cryptanalysis to decrypt your message. It's gonna help them a lot to determine, well, this right here probably look like a signature. Let's see what types of signature this user is using. And there you go. It already has something to work with. So we have a solution to this. And this solution is called block chaining. Let me show you an example on Wikipedia because uh, it does have a pretty nice representation of the problem that we're currently talking about. Now, the first version right here called Electronic Codebook or ECB, this is the first implementation of block encryption. You can see we have the plain text here at the top. We have the key. And then combining the plain text with the key inside of the encryption algorithm results in ciphertext. And we do this over and over again for each and every block. You can see here that's the simplest and not to be used anymore of the encryption methods. Now, in order to avoid this problem here, where we always get the same ciphertext, if we provide the same plain text as an input, we also have an implementation called cipher block chaining. Now cipher block chaining relies on the fact that we start with an initialization vector, just like the one we talked about when we mentioned symmetric encryption. So we start with some random data here. We combine the plain text with the IV and the key. We perform encryption and then we have a resulting cipher text. Now look what happens next. We take the resulting cipher text and we provide it as an input to the next block encryption operation which kind of creates a block chain, right? <laughs> it's actually the, the one of the principles on which the blockchain technology relies as well. So in this situation right here, even though we provide the same plain text inputs, even though it might happen that two different blocks here are gonna look exactly the same in plain text, the resulting ciphertext for both of them is gonna be different because the second one relies on the previous block, which means that the input that gets calculated inside of this encryption block is already different from the previous block. So this encryption method creates a lot of difficulty when performing cryptanalysis and trying to break the encryption algorithm. Now, there are more implementation methods, of course, but we're gonna stop right here because this is enough, at least for this exam. All right, so since we just talked about symmetric encryption, you can probably guess that we have something called asymmetric encryption as well. Why is it asymmetric? Well, because we're not using the same key anymore to both encrypt and decrypt. We're using, you guessed it, two keys. <laughs> and those two keys are being generated together and they're called a key pair. Not surprising, I know. And that key pair is made up of a private key this one is a key that you're supposed to hold on to for dear life. This is a key that you never have to share with anyone. And I mean anyone. You shouldn't share it with your, your girlfriend, your boss, your dog. Nobody should ever get their hands on your private key. That's how private it's supposed to be. <laughs> then we also have the public key, which completely opposed to the private key. You're supposed to give to everyone and to anyone. <laughs> What's the purpose of the private key you might be thinking right now? I mean, it's a key, right? If I, if I lock my house with a key, am I supposed to give that key to anyone out there? What's the point of it? Well, in asymmetric encryption and asymmetric cryptography, yes, you're supposed to give the public key to anyone. Let's see how this works, actually. First of all, why do we have two keys? Well, we have two keys because those two keys are interconnected mathematically. And that type of interconnection makes it possible so that whatever one key encrypts, only the other key can decrypt. So if you're encrypting something with the private key, you can only decrypt it with the public key. If you're encrypting something with the public key, you can only decrypt it with the private key, but never 
using the same key. We cannot perform both operations with the same key. And there's a way to derive the public key from the private one, because what you're basically generating from the very beginning is a private key. And then you're using that private key to generate a public key. And that's the one that you can share to anyone, but nobody else can deduce the private key from the public key that you're giving them, right? So we can only generate them one way. First the private key, then the public one, but not in reverse. So why is this so complicated? I mean, okay, we're using two keys instead of one. Is this really more secure? Well, yes. That's because this implementation helps us solve the problem of key distribution. Remember the problem we had with symmetric encryption? We, we can send the encrypted message, but how do we send the decryption key so that it's not going to be intercepted or, or used by unintended persons? So the public private key pair implementation makes it possible so that if you want to send me an encrypted message, I can give you my public key and I don't care how I give it to you. I can just post it online and can send it over email. I, it's public. I don't care if the whole world has it, but eventually that public key gets to you, reaches you. And then you can use that public key to encrypt a piece of data for me. You send me that piece of data. And I am the only one because I'm the only owner of the private key that can decrypt that data. And there you have it. You have confidentiality and you also solve the problem of distributing the encryption keys because now I don't care who owns my public key. The public key can only be used to encrypt information for me that is destined for me only. See where this is going. See how this kind of starts making sense when we're trying to protect encrypted data. All right, so apparently asymmetric encryption solves everything, right? So why do we still have <laughs> symmetric encryption? <laughs> well, the problem with asymmetric encryption is that is painfully slower than symmetric encryption. It's mathematically complex and computationally very intensive. It takes a lot of CPU resources to perform asymmetric encryption. Secondly, that's the biggest downside actually. You can only protect as much data as the length of the encryption key allows you to. So you can never protect more information than the length of the key. If you have a 2048 bit key, an asymmetric key of 2048 bits, that's how much data you can encrypt with it. That's it. Mm. So we can see that's a very big downside, which doesn't mean that asymmetric encryption is not usable. Well, it's not going to be usable for encrypting an entire movie, of course, but we can use it to encrypt things such as authentication data, like user credentials and passwords. And we can even use it for a more spectacular use case. You guessed it. We can use asymmetric encryption to encrypt the symmetric key that we're going to use from now on to encrypt a large amount of data. So that's exactly what happens whenever you establish a secure connection to a website over HTTPS, or whenever you're connecting over VPN to your company's VPN endpoint. The first thing you do is to negotiate based on public keys, on certificates and, pub and private keys, you're going to negotiate, you're going to exchange just enough information for you and the VPN endpoint to negotiate a symmetric key that you'll be using to encrypt the rest of the data because since we cannot use the public and private key pairs to encrypt the entire VPN contents, but we can use them to encrypt just a single password, maybe a randomly generated string that from now on is going to be used as the symmetric encryption key for all the rest of the data. This is pretty much how the real world implementations work. Whew, so hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> really hope it made sense. <laughs> now the implementation of public key uh, cryptography or the uh, algorithm that can help us generate those public and private key pairs are the major ones. Uh, RSA, this one is going to be used for encryption specifically, and uh, it's called a trapdoor algorithm because it's a type of function or a type of algorithm that can be easily computed if you know the public key but it cannot be easily reversed if you don't know the private key, right? So there's, that's basically a consequence of the fact that you cannot deduce the private key from a public one. We also have DSA, which also relies on public key cryptography, but we use this for digital signatures. And we also have ECC or elliptic curve cryptography, 
which uses a completely different mathematical model, but with a major advantage of being able to provide pretty much the same level of security uh, as the RSA implementation, for example, but at a tenth of the length of the key. So if RSA, let's say, can provide decent security using 2048-bit keys, uh, well, ECC can pretty much generate the same level of security using only 256-bit keys, which also makes it extremely convenient for low-powered and battery-operated devices, such as wearables, IoT devices, and until not so long ago, even mobile phones. But nowadays, mobile phones are just workhorses. <laughs> they, they pack a lot of power, a lot of processing power. So ECC is not really a requirement for mobile phones anymore. Well, tough content, I know, but I tried to cover it in a as simple manner as possible. Trust me, things are much more complicated when you start looking under the hood and see what exactly is happening in, uh, in cryptography. I tried to keep it simple, and hopefully I did. If you want to know more about this, if you want to discuss some more, leave a comment in the comment section. And also, if you found this useful and informative, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time, where we'll keep talking about implementations, uh, where cryptography is a godsend. <laughs> it actually makes things like online shopping and online banking and, and the cloud possible nowadays. But until next time, good luck, thank you for watching, and see you on the next video. Bye-bye.